Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, it's Catherine Mansfield again. Can you tell she's my favorite? We have two stories for you, The Garden Party and Mr. and Mrs. Dove. Mansfield once said, Risk. Risk anything. Care no more for the opinion of others. Do the hardest thing on earth for you. Act for yourself. Face the truth. She was among an emerging female professional class and saw herself as a writer first, a woman second. The death of her young brother Leslie in the First World War devastated her, and she found solace in her remembrance of the country of her childhood. These remembrances were transformed into some of her finest writing, of which the garden party is one. And now, The Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield. After all, the weather was ideal. They could not have had a more perfect day for a garden party if they had ordered it. Windless, warm, the sky without a cloud. Only the blue is veiled with a haze of light gold, as it is sometimes in early summer. The gardener had been up since dawn, mowing the lawn and sweeping them, until the grass and the dark flat rosettes where the daisy plants had been seemed to shine. As for the roses, you could not help feeling they understood that roses are the only flower that impress people at garden parties, the only flower that everybody is certain of knowing. Hundreds, yes, literally hundreds, had come out in a single night. The green bushes bowed down as though they had been visited by archangels. Breakfast was not yet over before the man came to put up the marquee. "'Where do you want the marquee put, mother?' "'My dear child, it's no use asking me. "'I'm determined to leave everything to you children this year. "'Forget I'm your mother. "'Treat me as an honoured guest.' "'But Meg could not possibly go and supervise the men. "'She had washed her hair before breakfast, "'and she sat drinking her coffee in a green turban "'with the dark wet curl stamped on each cheek. "'Josie, the butterfly, always came down in a silk petticoat "'and a kimono jacket.' "'You'll have to go, Laura. You're the artistic one.' Away Laura flew, still holding her piece of bread and butter. "'It's so delicious to have an excuse for eating out of doors. "'And besides, she loved having to arrange things. "'She always felt she could do it so much better than anybody else. Four men in their shirt-sleeves stood grouped together on the garden path. "'They carried staves covered with rolls of canvas, "'and they had big tool-bags slung on their backs.' They looked impressive. Laura wished now that she had not got the bread and butter, but there was nowhere to put it, and she couldn't possibly throw it away. She blushed and tried to look severe, and even a little bit short-sighted as she came up to them. "'Good morning,' she said, copying her mother's voice, but that sounded so fearfully affected that she was ashamed and stammered like a little girl. "'Oh, uh, have you come? Um, Is it about the marquee? "'That's right, miss,' said the tallest of the men, a lanky, freckled fellow, and he shifted his tool-bag, knocked back his straw hat, and smiled down at her. "'That's about it.' His smile was so easy, so friendly, that Laura recovered. What nice eyes he had, small, but such a dark blue. And now she looked at the others. They were smiling, too. "'Cheer up. We won't bite,' their smile seemed to say. How very nice workmen were, and what a beautiful morning. She mustn't mention the morning. She must be businesslike. The Marquis. Well, what about the lily lawn? Would that do? And she pointed to the lily lawn with the hand that didn't hold the bread and butter. They turned. They stared in the direction. A little fat chap thrust out his upper lip, and the tall fellow frowned. I don't fancy it, said he. "'Not conspicuous enough, you see, with a thing like a marquee.' "'And he turned to Laura in his easy way. "'You want to put it somewhere where it'll give you a bang slap in the eye, if you follow me.' "'Laura's upbringing made her wonder for a moment "'whether it was quite respectful of a workman to talk to her of bangs slap in the eye. "'But she did quite follow him. "'A corner of the tennis court,' she suggested. "'But the band's going to be in one corner.' "'Hmm, going to have a band, are you?' said another workman. He was pale, 
He had a haggard look as his dark eyes scanned the tennis court. What was he thinking? Only a very small band, said Laura gently. Perhaps he wouldn't mind so much if the band was quite small. But the tall fellow interrupted. Look here, miss. That's the place. Against those trees over there. That'll do fine. Against the Caracas. Then the Caraca trees would be hidden. And they were so lovely with their broad, gleaming leaves and their clusters of yellow fruit. They were like trees you imagined growing on a desert island, proud, solitary, lifting their leaves and fruits to the sun in a kind of silent splendor. Must they be hidden by a marquee? They must. Already the men had shouldered their staves and were making for the place. Only the tall fellow was left. He bent down, pinched a sprig of lavender, put his thumb and forefinger to his nose and snuffed up the smell. When Laura saw that gesture, she forgot all about the Caracas in her wonder at him caring for things like that, caring for the smell of lavender. How many men that she knew would have done such a thing? Oh, how extraordinarily nice workmen were, she thought. Why couldn't she have a workman for her friends, rather than the silly boys she danced with and who came to Sunday night supper? She would get on much better with men like these. It was all the fault, she decided, as the tall fellow drew something on the back of an envelope, something that was to be looped up or left to hang, of these absurd class distinctions. Well, for her part, she didn't feel them. Not a bit. Not an atom. And now there came the chalk-chalk of wooden hammers. Someone whistled. Someone sang out, Are you all right there, matey? Matey? The friendliness of it. The... The... Just to prove how happy she was, just to show the tall fellow how at home she felt and how she despised stupid conventions, Laura took a big bite of her bread and butter as she stared at the little drawing. She felt just like a work girl. Laura! Laura, where are you? Telephone, Laura! A voice cried from the house. Coming! Away she skimmed over the lawn, up the path, up the steps, across the veranda, and into the porch. In the hall, her father and Laurie were brushing their hats, ready to go to the office. "'I say, Laura,' said Laurie very fast, "'you might just give a squeeze at my coat before this afternoon, see if it wants pressing.' "'I will,' said she. Suddenly she couldn't stop herself. She ran at Laurie and gave him a small, quick squeeze. "'Oh, I do love parties, don't you?' gasped Laura. Rather, said Laurie's warm, boyish voice, and he squeezed his sister too and gave her a gentle push. Dash off to the telephone, old girl. The telephone. Yes, yes, oh yes. Kitty, good morning, dear. Come to lunch? Do, dear. Delighted, of course. It will only be a very scratch meal. Just the crust sandwiches and broken meringue shells and what's left over. Yes, isn't it a perfect morning? You're white? Oh, I certainly should. One moment. Hold the line. Mother's calling. And Laura sat back. What, Mother? Can't hear. Mrs. Sheridan's voice floated down the stairs. Tell her to wear that sweet hat she had on last Sunday. Mother says to wear that sweet hat you had on last Sunday. Good. One o'clock. Bye-bye. Laura put back the receiver, flung her arms over her head, took a deep breath, stretched, and let them fall. Ah, <sighs> she sighed. And the moment after the sigh, she sat up quickly. She was still, listening. All the doors in the house seemed to be open. The house was alive with soft, quick steps and running voices. The green baize door that led to the kitchen regions swung open and shut with a muffled thud. And now there came a long, chuckling, absurd sound— it was the heavy piano being moved on its stiff casters. But the air, if you stopped to notice, was the air always like this? Little faint winds were playing chase, in at the tops of the windows, out at the doors. And there were two tiny spots of sun, one on the ink pot, one on a silver photograph frame, playing too. Darling little spots, especially the one on the ink pot lid. It was quite warm. A warm little silver star. She could have kissed it. The front door pealed, and there sounded the rustle of Sadie's print skirt on the stairs. A man's voice murmured. Sadie answered, careless. 
I'm sure I don't know. Wait, I'll ask Mrs. Sheridan. What is it, Sadie? Laura came into the hall. It's the florist, Miss Laura. It was indeed. There, just inside the door, stood a wide, shallow tray, full of pots of pink lilies. No other kind, nothing but lilies, canna lilies, big pink flowers, wide open, radiant, almost frightening alive on bright crimson stems. Oh, Sadie, said Laura, and the sound was like a little moan. She crouched down as if to warm herself at the blaze of lilies. She felt they were in her fingertips, on her lips, growing in her breast. It's some mistake, she said faintly. Nobody ever ordered so many. Sadie, go and find Mother. But at that moment, Mrs. Sheridan joined them. It's quite right, she said calmly. Yes, I ordered them. Aren't they lovely? She pressed Laura's arm. I was passing the shop yesterday, and I saw them in the window, and I suddenly thought for once in my life I shall have enough canna lilies. The garden party will be a good excuse. But I thought you said you didn't mean to interfere, said Laura. Sadie had gone. The florist's man was still outside at his van. She put her arm around her mother's neck and very gently bit her mother's ear. "'My darling child, you wouldn't like a logical mother, would you? Oh, don't do that. Here's the man.' He carried more lilies still, another whole tray. "'Bank them up just inside the door on both sides of the porch, please,' said Mrs. Sheridan. "'Don't you agree, Laura?' "'Oh, I do, mother.' In the drawing-room, Meg, Josie, and good little Hans had at last succeeded in moving the piano. "'Now, if we put this Chesterfield against the wall "'and move everything out of the room except the chairs, don't you think?' "'Quite.' "'Hans, move these tables into the smoking-room "'and bring a sweeper to take these marks off the floor. "'And oh, one moment, Hans.' "'Josie loved giving orders to the servants, "'and they loved obeying her. "'She always made them feel they were taking part in some drama. "'Tell Mother and Miss Laura to come here at once.' "'Very good, Miss Josie.' "'She turned to Meg. "'I want to hear what the piano sounds like, "'just in case I'm asked to sing this afternoon. "'Let's try over This Life is Weary.' "'Pum, ta-ta-ta, ti-ta.' "'The piano burst out so passionately "'that Josie's face changed. "'She clasped her hands. "'She looked mournfully and enigmatically "'at her mother and Laura as they came in. "'This life is weary.' A tear, a sigh, a love that changes. This life is weary. A tear, a sigh, a love that changes. And then, goodbye. But at the word goodbye, and although the piano sounded more desperate than ever, her face broke into a brilliant, dreadfully unsympathetic smile. Aren't I in good voice, Mummy? She beamed. Life is weary. Hope comes to die. A dream awakening. But now Sadie interrupted them. What is it, Sadie? If you please, ma'am, Cook says have you got the flags for the sandwiches? The flags for the sandwiches, Sadie? echoed Mrs. Sheridan dreamily, and the children knew by her face that she hadn't got them. Let me see. And she said to Sadie firmly, Tell Cook I'll let her have them in ten minutes. Sadie went. Now, Laura, said her mother quickly, come with me into the smoking room. I've got the names somewhere on the back of an envelope. You'll have to write them out for me. Meg, go upstairs this minute and take that wet thing off your head. Josie, run and finish dressing this instant. Do you hear me, children? Or shall I have to tell your father when he comes home tonight? And, Josie, pacify the cook if you do go into the kitchen, will you? I'm terrified of her this morning. The envelope was found at last behind the dining-room clock, though how it got there Mrs. Sheridan could not imagine. One of you children must have stolen it out of my bag, because I remember vividly cream cheese and lemon curd. Have you done that? Yes. Egg and... Mrs. Sheridan held the envelope away from her. It looks like mice. It can't be mice, can it? Olive, pet said Laura, looking over her shoulder. Oh, yes, of course, olive. What a horrible combination it sounds. Egg and olive. They were finished at last, 
and Laura took them off to the kitchen. She found Josie there pacifying the cook, who did not look at all terrifying. "'I have never seen such exquisite sandwiches,' said Josie's rapturous voice. "'How many kinds did you say there were, cook? Fifteen? Fifteen, Miss Josie. "'Well, cook, I congratulate you.' Cook swept up crust with the long sandwich knife and smiled broadly. "'Godbirds is calm,' announced Sadie, issuing out of the pantry. She had seen the man pass the window. That meant the cream puffs had come. Godbirds were famous for their cream puffs. Nobody ever thought of making them at home. "'Bring them in and put them on the table, my girl,' ordered Cook. Sadie brought them in and went back to the door. Of course, Laura and Josie were far too grown up to really care about such things. All the same, they couldn't help agreeing that the puffs looked very attractive. Very. Cook began arranging them, shaking off the extra icing sugar. "'Don't they carry one back to all one's parties?' said Laura. "'I suppose they do,' said practical Josie, who never liked to be carried back. "'They look beautifully light and feathery, I must say.' "'Have one each, my dears,' said Cook in her comfortable voice. "'Your ma won't know.' "'Oh, impossible! Fancy cream puffs so soon after breakfast. The very idea made one shudder. All the same, two minutes later, Josie and Laura were licking their fingers with that absorbed inward look that only comes from whipped cream. "'Let's go into the garden, out by the back way,' suggested Laura. "'I want to see how the men are getting on with the Marquis. They're such awfully nice men.' But the back door was blocked by Cook, Sadie, Godber's man, and Hans. Something had happened. <coughs> Clucked Cook like an agitated hen. Sadie had her hand clapped to her cheek as though she had toothache. Hans' face was screwed up in an effort to understand. Only Godber's man seemed to be enjoying himself. It was his story. "'What's the matter? What's happened?' "'There's been a horrible accident,' said Cook. "'A man killed.' "'A man killed? Where? How? When?' But Godber's man wasn't going to have his story snatched from under his very nose. "'Know those little cottages just below here, miss?' "'Know them? Of course she knew them. "'Well, there's a young chap lived there named Scott, a carter. "'His horse shied at a traction engine, corner of Hawk Street this morning, "'and he was thrown out on the back of his head, killed.' Dead. Laura stared at Godber's man. Dead when they picked him up, said Godber's man with relish. They were taking the body home as I come here. And he said to the cook, He's left a wife and five little ones. Josie, come here. Laura caught hold of her sister's sleeve and dragged her through the kitchen to the other side of the green baize door. There she paused and leaned against it. Josie, she said, horrified. However are we going to stop everything? "'Stop everything, Laura,' cried Josie in astonishment. "'What do you mean?' "'Stop the garden party, of course. "'Why did Josie pretend?' "'But Josie was still more amazed. "'Stop the garden party? "'My dear Laura, don't be so absurd. "'Of course we can't do anything of the kind. "'Nobody expects us to. "'Don't be so extravagant.' "'But we can't possibly have a garden party with a man dead "'just outside the front gate.' "'That really was extravagant.' for the little cottages were in a lane to themselves at the very bottom of a steep rise that led up to the house. A broad road ran between. True, they were far too near. They were the greatest possible eyesore, and they had no right to be in that neighborhood at all. They were little mean dwellings painted a chocolate brown. In the garden patches there was nothing but cabbage stalks, sick hens, and tomato cans. The very smoke coming out of their chimneys was poverty-stricken, little rags and shreds of smoke, so unlike the great silvery plumes that uncurled from the Sheridan's chimney. Washerwomen lived in the lane, and sweeps, and a cobbler, and a man whose house front was studded all over with minute bird cages. Children swarmed. When the Sheridans were little, they were forbidden to set foot there because of the revolting language and of what they might catch. But since they were grown up, Laura and Laurie on their prowls, sometimes walked through. It was disgusting and sordid. They came out with a shudder. But still, one must go everywhere. One must see everything. So through they went. And just think of what the band would sound like to that poor woman, 
said Laura. Oh, Laura, Josie began to be seriously annoyed. If you're going to stop a band playing every time someone has an accident, you'll lead a very strenuous life. I'm every bit as sorry about it as you. I feel just as sympathetic. Her eyes hardened. She looked at her sister just as she used to when they were little and fighting together. You won't bring a drunken workman back to life by being sentimental, she said softly. Drunk? Who said he was drunk? Laura turned furiously on Josie. She said, just as they had used to say on those occasions, I'm going straight up to tell Mother. Oh, dear, cooed Josie. Mother, can I come into your room? Laura turned the big glass doorknob. Of course, child. Why, what's the matter? What's given you such a color? And Mrs. Sheridan turned round from her dressing table. She was tying on a new hat. Mother, a man's been killed, began Laura. Not in the garden, interrupted her mother. No, no. Oh, what a fright you gave me. Mrs. Sheridan sighed with relief and took off the big hat and held it on her knees. But listen, mother, said Laura. Breathless, half choking, she told the dreadful story. Of course, we can't have our party, can we? she pleaded. The band and everybody arriving, they'd hear us, mother. They're nearly neighbors. To Laura's astonishment, her mother behaved just like Josie. It was harder to bear because she seemed amused. She refused to take Laura seriously. But, my dear child, use your common sense. It's only by accident we've heard of it. If someone had died there normally, and I can't understand how they keep alive in those pokey little holes, we should still be having our party, shouldn't we? Laura had to say yes to that, but she felt it was all wrong. She sat down on her mother's sofa and pinched the cushion frill. Mother, isn't it terribly heartless of us? she asked. Darling! Mrs. Sheraton got up and came over to her, carrying the hat. Before Laura could stop her, she had popped it on. My child, said her mother, the hat is yours. It's made for you. It's much too young for me. I have never seen you look such a picture. Look at yourself. And she held up her hand mirror. But mother, Laura began. She couldn't look at herself. She turned aside. This time, Mrs. Sheridan lost patience just as Josie had done. "'You are being very absurd, Laura,' she said coldly. "'People like that don't expect sacrifices from us, "'and it's not very sympathetic to spoil everybody's enjoyment as you're doing now.' "'I don't understand,' said Laura, "'and she walked quickly out of the room into her own bedroom. "'There, quite by chance, the first thing she saw was this charming girl in the mirror,' in her black hat trimmed with gold daisies and a long black velvet ribbon. Never had she imagined she could look like that. Is mother right? she thought. And now she hoped her mother was right. Am I being extravagant? Perhaps it was extravagant. Just for a moment she had another glimpse of that poor woman and those little children and the body being carried into the house. But it all seemed blurred, unreal, like a picture in the newspaper. I'll remember it again after the party's over, she decided, and somehow that seemed quite the best plan. Lunch was over by half-past one. By half-past two, they were all ready for the fray. The green-coated band had arrived and was established in a corner of the tennis court. My dear, trilled Kitty Maitland, "'Aren't they too like frogs for words? "'You ought to have arranged them around the pond "'with the conductor in the middle on a leaf.' "'Laurie had arrived and hailed them on his way to dress. "'At the sight of him, Laura remembered the accident. "'She wanted to tell him. "'If Laurie agreed with the others, "'then it was bound to be all right, "'and she followed him into the hall. "'Laurie!' "'Hello!' He was halfway upstairs, but when he turned round and saw Laura, he suddenly puffed out his cheeks and googled his eyes at her. "'My word, Laura, you do look stunning,' said Laurie. "'What an absolutely topping hat!' Laura said faintly, "'Is it?' and smiled up at Laurie, and didn't tell him after all. Soon after that, people began coming in streams. The band struck up. The hired waiters ran from the house to the marquee. 
Wherever you looked, there were couples strolling, bending to the flowers, greeting, moving on over the lawn. They were like bright birds that had alighted in the Sheridan's garden for this one afternoon, on their way to... where? Ah, what happiness it is to be with people who are all happy, to press hands, press cheeks, smile into eyes. Darling Laura, how well you look! What a becoming hat, child! Laura, you look quite Spanish. I've never seen you look so striking. And Laura, glowing, answered softly, Have you had tea? Won't you have an ice? The passion fruit ices really are rather special. She ran to her father and begged him, Daddy, darling, can't the band have something to drink? And the perfect afternoon slowly ripened, slowly faded, slowly its petals closed. Never a more delightful garden party. The greatest success. Quite the most. Laura helped her mother with the goodbyes. They stood side by side in the porch till it was all over. All over, all over, thank heaven, said Mrs. Sheridan. Round up the others, Laura. Let's go and have some fresh coffee. I'm exhausted. Yes, it's been very successful, but oh, these parties, these parties. Why will you children insist on giving parties? And they all of them sat down in the deserted marquee. Have a sandwich, Daddy dear. I wrote the flag. Thanks. Mr. Sheridan took a bite and the sandwich was gone. He took another. I suppose you didn't hear of the beastly accident that happened today, he said. My dear, said Mrs. Sheridan, holding up her hand, we did. It nearly ruined the party. Laura insisted we should put it off. Oh, mother. Laura didn't want to be teased about it. It was a horrible affair all the same, said Mr. Sheridan. The chap was married to live just below in the lane and leaves a wife and half a dozen kiddies, so they say. An awkward little silence fell. Mrs. Sheridan fidgeted with her cup. Really, it was very tactless to father. Suddenly she looked up. There on the table were all those sandwiches, cakes, puffs, all uneaten, all going to be wasted. She had one of her brilliant ideas. I know, she said. Let's make up a basket. Let's send that poor creature some of this perfectly good food. At any rate, it will be the greatest treat for the children, don't you agree? And she's sure to have neighbors calling in and so on. What a point to have it already prepared. Laura, she jumped up, get me the big basket out of the stairs cupboard. But, Mother, do you really think it's a good idea? said Laura. Again, how curious. She seemed to be different from them all, to take scraps from their party. Would the poor woman really like that? Of course. What's the matter with you today? An hour or two ago you were insisting on us being sympathetic, and now... Oh, well, Laura ran for the basket. It was filled, it was heaped by her mother. Take it yourself, darling, said she. Run down just as you are. No, wait, take the arum lilies, too. People of that class are so impressed by arum lilies. The stems will ruin her lace frock, said practical Josie. So they would, just in time. Only the basket, then, and Laura, her mother followed her out of the marquee. Don't on any account. What, mother? No, better not put such ideas into the child's head. Nothing. Run along. It was just growing dusky as Laura shut their garden gates. A big dog ran by like a shadow. The road gleamed white, and down below in the hollow the little cottages were in deep shade. How quiet it seemed after the afternoon. Here she was going down the hill to somewhere where a man lay dead, and she couldn't realize it. Why couldn't she? She stopped a minute, and it seemed to her that kisses, voices, Tinkling spoons, laughter, the smell of crushed grass were somehow inside her. She had no room for anything else. How strange. She looked up at the pale sky, and all she thought was, yes, it was the most successful party. Now the broad road was crossed. The lane began, smoky and dark. Women in shawls and men's tweed caps hurried by. Men hung over the pawlings. The children played in the doorways. A low hum came from the mean little cottages. 
In some of them there was a flicker of light, and a shadow, crab-like, moved across the window. Laura bent her head and hurried on. She wished now she had put on a coat. How her frock shone! And the big hat with the velvet streamer? If only it was another hat. Were the people all looking at her? They must be. It was a mistake to have come. She knew all along it was a mistake. Should she go back even now? No, too late. This was the house. It must be. A dark knot of people stood outside. Beside the gate, an old, old woman with a crutch sat in a chair, watching. She had her feet on a newspaper. The voices stopped as Laura drew near. The group parted. It was as though she was expected, as though they had known she was coming here. Laura was terribly nervous. Tossing the velvet ribbon over her shoulder, she said to a woman standing by, "'Is this Mrs. Scott's house?' And the woman, smiling queerly, said, "'It is, my lass.' "'Oh, to be away from this,' she actually said, "'Help me, God,' as she walked up the tiny path and knocked. "'To be away from those staring eyes, or to be covered up in anything, "'one of those women's shawls, even. "'I'll just leave the basket and go,' she decided. "'I shan't even wait for it to be emptied.' "'Then the door opened. "'A little woman in black showed in the gloom. "'Laura said, "'Are you Mrs. Scott?' "'But to her horror the woman answered, "'Walk in, please, miss.' and she was shut in the passage. No, said Laura, I don't want to come in. I only want to leave this basket. Mother sent... The little woman in the gloomy passage seemed not to have heard her. Step this way, please, miss, she said in an oily voice, and Laura followed her. She found herself in a wretched little low kitchen, lighted by a smoky lamp. There was a woman sitting before the fire. Am? said the little creature who had let her in. Em, it's a young lady. She turned to Laura. She said meaningly, I'm her sister, miss. You'll excuse her, won't you? Oh, but of course, said Laura. Please, please don't disturb her. I, I only want to leave. But at that moment, the woman at the fire turned round. Her face, puffed up, red, with swollen eyes and swollen lips, looked terrible. She seemed as though she couldn't understand why Laura was there. What did it mean? Why was this stranger standing in the kitchen with a basket? What was it all about? And the poor face puckered up again. All right, my dear, said the other. I'll thank the young lady. And again she began. You'll excuse her, miss, I'm sure. And her face, swollen too, tried an oily smile. Laura only wanted to get out, to get away. She was back in the passage. The door opened. She walked straight through into the bedroom where the dead man was lying. "'You'd like a look at him, wouldn't you?' said Em's sister. And she brushed past Laura over to the bed. "'Don't be afraid, my lass.' And now her voice sounded fond and sly, and fondly she drew down the sheet. "'A looks a picture. There's nothing to show.' Come along, my dear. Laura came. There lay a young man, fast asleep, sleeping so soundly, so deeply, that he was far, far away from them both. Oh, so remote, so peaceful. He was dreaming. Never wake him up again. His head was sunk in the pillow. His eyes were closed. They were blind under the closed eyelids. He was given up to his dream. What did garden parties and baskets and lace frocks matter to him? He was far from all those things. He was wonderful, beautiful. While they were laughing and while the band was playing, this marvel had come to the lane. Happy, happy, all is well, said that sleeping face. This is just as it should be. I am content. But all the same you had to cry and she couldn't go out of the room without saying something to him, Laura gave him a loud, childish sob. "'Forgive my hat,' she said. And this time she didn't wait for Em's sister. She found her way out of the door, down the path, past all those dark people. At the corner of the lane she met Laurie. He stepped out of the shadow. "'Is that you, Laura?' "'Yes,' 
Mother was getting anxious. Was it all right? Yes, quite. Oh, Laurie. She took his arm. She pressed up against him. I say, you're not crying, are you? asked her brother. Laura shook her head. She was. Laurie put his arm around her shoulder. Don't cry, he said in his warm, loving voice. Was it awful? No, sobbed Laura. It was simply marvelous. But Laurie... She stopped. She looked at her brother. Isn't life... She stammered. Isn't life... But what life was, she couldn't explain. No matter. He quite understood. Isn't it, darling? Said Laurie. And now, Mr. and Mrs. Dove by Catherine Mansfield. Of course he knew, no man better, that he hadn't a ghost of a chance. He hadn't an earthly. The very idea of such a thing was preposterous. So preposterous that he'd perfectly understood it if her father... Well, whatever her father chose to do, he'd perfectly understand. In fact, nothing short of desperation, nothing short of the fact that this was positively his last day in England, for God knows how long, would have screwed him up to it. And even now... He chose a tie out of the chest of drawers, a blue and cream-checked tie, and sat on the side of his bed. Supposing she replied, "'What impertinence!' Would he be surprised? Not in the least, he decided, turning up his soft collar and turning it down over the tie. He expected her to say something like that. He didn't see, if he looked at the affair dead soberly, what else she could say. Here he was, and nervously he tied a bow in front of the mirror, jammed his hair down with both hands, pulled out the flaps of his jacket pockets, making between five hundred and six hundred pounds a year on a fruit farm in, of all places, Rhodesia. No capital, not a penny coming to him, no chance of his income increasing for at least four years. As for looks and all that sort of thing, he was completely out of the running. He couldn't even boast of top-hole health for the East Africa business had knocked him out so thoroughly that he'd had to take six months' leave. He was still fearfully pale, worse even than usual this afternoon, he thought, bending forward and peering into the mirror. Good heavens! What had happened? His hair looked almost green. Dash it all, he hadn't green hair at all events. This was a bit too steep. And then the green light trembled in the glass. It was the shadow from the tree outside— Reggie turned away, took out a cigarette case, but remembered how the mater hated him to smoke in his bedroom, put it back again, and drifted over the chest of drawers. No, he was dashed if he could think of one blessed thing in his favor, while she... Ah! He stopped dead, folded his arms, and leaned hard against the chest of drawers. And in spite of her position, her father's wealth, the fact that she was an only child, and far and away the most popular girl in the neighborhood... In spite of her beauty and her cleverness, cleverness, it was a great deal more than that, there was really nothing she couldn't do. He fully believed, had it been necessary, she would have been a genius at anything. In spite of the fact that her parents adored her, and she them, and they'd as soon let her go all that way as, in spite of every single thing you could think of, so terrific was his love that he couldn't help hoping. Well, was it hope? Or was this queer, timid longing to have the chance to look after her, of making it his job to see that she had everything she wanted and that nothing came near her that wasn't perfect, just love? How he loved her. He squeezed hard against the chest of drawers and murmured to it, I love her, I love her. And just for the moment, he was with her on the way to Umtali. It was night. She sat in a corner asleep. Her soft chin was tucked into her soft collar. Her gold-brown lashes lay on her cheeks. He doted on her delicate little nose, her perfect lips, her ear like a baby's, and the gold-brown curl that half covered it. They were passing through the jungle. It was warm and dark and far away. Then she woke up and said, Have I been sleeping? And he answered, Yes. Are you all right? Here, let me. And he leaned forward to... He bent over her. This was such bliss that he could dream no further, but it gave him the courage to bound down the stairs to snatch his straw hat from the hall and to say as he closed the front door, Well, I can only try my luck, that's all.
but his luck gave him a nasty jar, to say the least, almost immediately, promenading up and down the garden path with Chinny and Biddy, the ancient peaks, was the mater. Of course Reginald was fond of the mater and all. She meant well. She had no end of grit, and so on. But there was no denying it. She was rather a grim parent, and there had been moments, many of them in Reggie's life, before Uncle Alec died and left him the fruit farm, when he was convinced that to be a widow's only son was about the worst punishment a chap could have, and what made it rougher than ever was that she was positively all that he had. She wasn't only a combined parent, as it were, but she had quarreled with all her own and the governor's relations before Reggie had won his first trouser pockets, so that whenever Reggie was homesick out there, sitting on the dark veranda by starlight, while the gramophone cried, "'Dear, what is life but love?' His only vision was of the mater, tall and stout, rustling down the garden path, with Chinny and Biddy at her heels. The mater, with her scissors outspread to snap the head of a dead something or other, stopped at the sight of Reggie. "'You are not going out, Reginald?' she asked, seeing that he was. "'I'll be back for tea, mater.' said Reggie weakly, plunging his hand into his pockets. Snip! Off came a head. Reggie almost jumped. I should have thought you could have spared your mother your last afternoon, said she. Silence. The peaks stared. They understood every word of the maters. Biddy lay down with her tongue poked out. She was so fat and glossy. She looked like a lump of half-melted toffee. But Chinny's porcelain eyes gloomed at Reginald, and he sniffed faintly, as though the whole world were one unpleasant smell. Snip went the scissors again. Poor little beggars, they were getting it. "'And where are you going, if your mother may ask?' asked the mater. It was over at last, but Reggie did not slow down until he was out of sight of the house and halfway to Colonel Proctor's. Then only he noticed what a top-hole afternoon it was— it had been raining all morning, late summer rain, warm, heavy, quick, and now the sky was clear except for a long tail of little clouds, like ducklings sailing over the forest. There was just enough wind to shake the last drops off the trees. One warm star splashed on his hand. Ping! Another drummed on his hat. The empty road gleamed. The hedges smelled of briar and how big and bright the hollyhocks glowed in the cottage gardens. And here was Colonel Proctor's. Here it was already. His hand was on the gate. His elbow jogged the syringa bushes, and petals and pollen scattered all over his coat sleeve. But wait a bit. This was too quick altogether. He meant to think the whole thing out again. Here, steady. But he was walking up the path with the huge rose bushes on either side. It can't be done like this but his hand had grasped the bell, given it a pull, and started it peeling wildly as if he'd come to say the house was on fire. The housemaid must have been in the hall, too, for the front door flashed open, and Reggie was shut in the empty drawing-room before that confounded bell stopped ringing. Strangely enough, when it did, the big room, shadowy, with someone's parasol lying on top of the grand piano, bucked him up, or rather excited him, it was so quiet, and yet in one moment the door would open and his fate would be decided. The feeling was not unlike that of being at the dentist. He was almost reckless. But at the same time, to his immense surprise, Reggie heard himself saying, Lord, thou knowest, thou hast not done much for me. That pulled him up. That made him realize again how dead serious it was. Too late, the door handle turned. Anne came in, crossed the shadowy space between them, gave him her hand, and said in her small, soft voice, "'I'm so sorry. Father is out, and Mother is having a day in town, hat-hunting. There's only me to entertain you, Reggie.' Reggie gasped, pressed his own hat to his jacket buttons, and stammered out, "'As a matter of fact, I've only come to say good-bye.' "'Oh!' cried Anne softly. She stepped back from him, and her gray eyes danced. What a very short visit! Then, watching him, her chin tilted. She laughed outright, a long, soft peal, and walked away from him over to the piano and leaned against it, playing with the tassel of the parasol. I'm so sorry, she said, to be laughing like this. I don't know why I do. It's just a bad habit. 
and suddenly she stamped her gray shoe and took a pocket handkerchief out of her white woolly jacket. I really must conquer it. It's too absurd, said she. Good heavens, Anne, cried Reggie. I love to hear you laughing. I can't imagine anything more. But the truth was, and they both knew it, she wasn't always laughing. It wasn't really a habit. Only ever since the day they'd met, ever since that very first moment, for some strange reason that Reggie wished to God he understood, Anne had laughed at him. Why? It didn't matter where they were or what they were talking about. They might begin by being as serious as possible, dead serious, at any rate, as far as he was concerned. But then suddenly, in the middle of a sentence, Anne would glance at him, and a little quick quiver passed over her face. Her lips parted, her eyes danced, and she began laughing. Another queer thing about it was, Reggie had an idea she didn't herself know why she laughed. He had seen her turn away, frown, suck in her cheeks, press her hands together, but it was no use. The long, soft peal sounded, even while she cried, I don't know why I'm laughing. It was a mystery. Now she tucked the handkerchief away. Do sit down, said she, and smoke, won't you? There are cigarettes in that little box beside you. I'll have one, too. He lighted a match for her, and as she bent forward, he saw the tiny flame glow in the pearl ring she wore. It is tomorrow that you're going, isn't it? said Anne. Yes, tomorrow as ever was, said Reggie, and he blew a little fan of smoke. Why on earth was he so nervous? Nervous wasn't the word for it. It's, it's frightfully hard to believe, he added. Yes, isn't it? said Anne softly, and she leaned forward and rolled the point of her cigarette round the green ashtray. How beautiful she looked like that, simply beautiful, and she was so small in that immense chair. Reginald's heart swelled with tenderness, but it was her voice, her soft voice that made him tremble. I feel you've been here for years, she said. Reginald took a deep breath of his cigarette. It's ghastly, this idea of going back, he said. Coo, hoo, coo, 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 sounded from the quiet. But you're fond of being out there, aren't you? said Anne. She hooked her finger through her pearl necklace. Father was saying only the other night how lucky he thought you were to have a life of your own. And she looked up at him. Reginald's smile was rather wan. I don't feel very lucky, he said lightly. Roo, coo, 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 came again, and Anne murmured, You don't mean it's lonely. Oh, it isn't the loneliness I care about, said Reginald, and he stumped his cigarette savagely on the green ashtray. I could stand any amount of it, used to like it even. It's the idea of... Suddenly, to his horror, he felt himself blushing. Roo, coo, coo, coo. Anne jumped up. Come and say goodbye to my doves, she said. They've been moved to the side veranda. You do like doves, don't you, Reggie? Awfully, said Reggie, so fervently that he opened the French window for her and stood to one side. Anne ran forward and laughed at the doves instead. To and fro, to and fro over the fine red sand on the floor of the dove house walked the two doves. One was always in front of the other, one ran forward, uttering a little cry, and the other followed, solemnly bowing and bowing. "'You see,' explained Anne, "'the one in front, she's Mrs. Dove. She looks at Mr. Dove and gives that little laugh and runs forward, and he follows her, bowing and bowing, and that makes her laugh again. Away she runs, and after her,' cried Anne, and she sat back on her heels." comes poor Mr. Dove bowing and bowing, and that's their whole life. They never do anything else, you know. She got up and took some yellow grains out of a bag on the roof of the dove house. When you think of them out in Rhodesia, Reggie, you can be sure that is what they will be doing. Reggie gave no sign of having seen the doves or having heard a word. For the moment he was conscious only of the immense effort it took to tear his secret out of himself and offer it to Anne. Anne... Do you think you could ever care for me? It was done. It was over. 
and in the little pause that followed, Reginald saw the garden open to the light, the blue quivering sky, the flutter of leaves on the veranda poles, and Anne turning over the grains of maize on her palm with one finger. Then slowly she shut her hand, and the new world faded as she murmured slowly, No, never in that way. But he had scarcely time to feel anything before she walked quickly away, and he followed her down the steps, along the garden path, under the pink rose arches, across the lawn. There, with the gay, herbaceous border behind her, Anne faced Reginald. "'It isn't that I'm not awfully fond of you,' she said. "'I am. But—' Her eyes widened. "'Not in the way—' A quiver passed over her face. "'One ought to be fond of—' Her lips parted, and she couldn't stop herself. She began laughing. "'There, you see, you see,' she cried. "'It's your checked t -t tie Even at this moment, when one would think one really would be solemn, your tie reminds me fearfully of the bow-tie that cats wear in pictures. <laughs> oh, please, forgive me for being so horrid. Please!' Reggie caught hold of her little warm hand. "'There's no question of forgiving you,' he said quickly. "'How could there be?' and I do believe I know why I make you laugh. It's because you're so far above me, in every way, that I am somehow ridiculous. I see that, Anne. But if I were to— No, no. Anne squeezed his hand hard. It's not that. That's all wrong. I'm not far above you at all. You're much better than I am. You're marvelously unselfish and, and kind and simple. I'm none of those things. "'You don't know me. I'm the most awful character,' said Anne. "'Please don't interrupt. And besides, that's not the point. "'The point is,' she shook her head, "'I couldn't possibly marry a man I laughed at. "'Surely you see that. "'The man I marry,' breathed Anne softly. "'She broke off. She drew her hand away, "'and looking at Reggie, she smiled strangely, dreamily.' The man I marry. And it seemed to Reggie that a tall, handsome, brilliant stranger stepped in front of him and took his place, the kind of man that Anne and he had seen often at the theatres, walking onto the stage from nowhere, without a word catching the heroine in his arms, and after one long, tremendous look, carrying her off anywhere. Reggie bowed to his vision. Yes, I see, he said huskily. Do you? said Anne. Oh, I do hope you do, because I feel so hard about it. It's so hard to explain. You know, I've never... She stopped. Reggie looked at her. She was smiling. Isn't it funny? She said. I can say anything to you. I've always been able to from the very beginning. He tried to smile, to say I'm glad. She went on. I've never known anyone I like as much as I like you. I've never felt so happy with anyone. But I'm sure it's not what people and what books mean when they talk about love. Do you understand? Oh, if you only knew how horrid I feel. But we'd be like, like Mr. and Mrs. Dove. That did it. That seemed to Reginald final, and so terribly true that he could hardly bear it. Don't drive it home, he said. And he turned away from Anne and looked across the lawn. There was the gardener's cottage, with the dark elix tree beside it. A wet, blue thumb of transparent smoke hung above the chimney. It didn't look real. How his throat ached. Could he speak? He had a shot. I must be getting along home, he croaked. And he began walking across the lawn. But Anne ran after him. No, don't. You can't go yet, she said imploringly. You can't possibly go away feeling like that and she stared up at him, frowning, biting her lip. "'Oh, that's all right,' said Reggie, giving himself a shake. "'I'll—I'll—' I'll. And he waved his hand as much to say, "'Get over it.' "'But this is awful,' said Anne. She clasped her hands and stood in front of him. "'Surely you do see how fatal it would be for us to marry, don't you?' "'Oh, quite, quite,' said Reggie, looking at her with haggard eyes. "'How wrong, how wicked, feeling as I do—' I mean, it's all very well for Mr. and Mrs. Dove, but imagine that in real life. 
Imagine it. Oh, absolutely, said Reggie, and he started to walk on. But again, Anne stopped him. She tugged at his sleeve, and to his astonishment this time, instead of laughing, she looked like a little girl who was going to cry. Then why, if you understand, are you so unhappy? She wailed. Why do you mind so fearfully? Why do you look so awful? Reggie gulped, and again he waved something away. I can't help it, he said. I've had a blow. If I cut off now, I'll be able to... How can you talk of cutting off now? said Anne scornfully. She stamped her foot at Reggie. She was crimson. How can you be so cruel? I can't let you go until I know for certain that you are just as happy as you were before you asked me to marry you. Surely you must see that. It's so simple. But it did not seem at all simple to Reginald. It seemed impossibly difficult. Even if I can't marry you, how can I know that you're all that way away, with only that awful mother to write to, and that you're miserable, and that it's all my fault? It's not your fault. Don't think that. It's just fate. Reginald took her hand off his sleeve and kissed it. Don't pity me, dear little Anne, he said gently. And this time he nearly ran under the pink arches along the garden path. Woo, coo, coo, coo. Woo, coo, coo, coo. Sounded from the veranda. Reggie, Reggie. From the garden. He stopped, he turned. But when she saw his timid, puzzled look, she gave a little laugh. Come back, Mr. Dove, said Anne, and Reginald came slowly across the lawn. And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed The Garden Party and Mr. and Mrs. Dove by Catherine Mansfield. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.